please welcome Dr. Lyman Wastrell, who's going to be speaking on Building the Parallel Economy, Alternative Pathways for Physician Licensure. Welcome. I live on a farm, by the way. <laughs> well, I appreciate all the presentations, and also I want to thank AAPS for the opportunity here to present a very important topic here that I think is going to be addressing all the things that we've been talking about throughout this day. Um, that being said, beforehand, I'm sure we've got a bunch of boosts out back there for our eighth COVID booster after all these vaccine talks. And then if you'd like, we could also have some masks, put those on, because we're all following the science here. So it, facts don't matter. Remember that. So, but anyway, so I might be a little bit sarcastic. If you read that bio, you might uh, catch that as well. I might offend somebody. Sorry. Um, <laughs> That being said, today I want to talk about what I'm calling building the parallel economy. I think that for some people, and, and forgive me, Tony, I'm going to go ahead and use my Cuban friend that I just met today, who uh, this COVID event really kind of opened people's eyes for the first time. Hey, there's something wrong with medicine, you think? But up until then, oftentimes you might have been that person who's just thinking, hey, the FDA, it's out there, you know, working for everybody's best interest, right? So it's the CDC. They're, they're, they're out there looking out for you, right? Their recommendations are good. Who could ever think that there might be ulterior motives going on in here? Um, my wife and I, we were uh, in residency in California, and we got an experience of the ulterior motives very early on in 2017. And through that process, we were able to walk away from it all um, before the COVID thing came. And so for us, it was a very easy decision when COVID came because we'd already left the plantation three years early. But um, at this point, our experience has kind of showed us that this, this system is rotten to its very core. And so what I'm talking to you about today is building alternative pathways into licensure for doctors. Some of you may have already experienced this. You may have had your license revoked because you did not follow the guidelines. And I put that in quotes. Um, I, I thought the guidelines were guides rather than orders, but that being said, so I want to talk to you about building a parallel systems that will help us to begin the process of actually fighting back against a system that is deeply corrupt at this point. So we start off with something that I think a lot of people are aware of, and so I've got this slide here. It's uh, actually from 2008. I don't need newer data because it's still the same. Uh, we have a sh physician shortage, um, and it's getting worse. Now, this is uh, data from the AMA, which I don't necessarily trust their data, but even they admit there's a problem. Um, but what I would actually try to point out to you is that this problem was here a long time ago. Um, the 10 minute physician encounter, is that normal? I don't think it should be. I think you should probably have some time to talk to your patient, actually get to know their name maybe even. Um, I don't know, I'm crazy like that. Physician extenders. Um, the bifurcation of that patient-doctor relationship. The medical assistant asks all the questions. You don't even know what's going on. All of a sudden, you discover that that, that person has no legs. That might have been important for you to know. <laughs> but uh, th this, this uh, shortage has actually been showing up for a long time, for decades. And we have come up with more and more ways of trying to fix a shortage that the uh, national organizations have had no interest in, in fixing. It changed the practice of medicine to the point where um, medicine is not even, uh, if I was to have an old doctor compared to a new doctor, put them side by side, the, the, the picture would be so dramatically different at this point. We all know this is true. So oftentimes we point to this graph. So this is the match program, residency. We see that the, the line at the top is those that are applying into the match process. These are people who graduated from medical school who are actually doctors. The line below it, the red line, is the line of, of actual available slots. Now, I don't know if the graph gives it uh, quite the justice that we need. If you remember your calculus from back in the day, remember the area under the curve added together? Uh, that's a shortage. That's a shortage that's showing up. Um, the estimates are that we need to train uh, 33,000 new doctors a year. At the t of th this is probably five-year-old data, so it, it might be a little higher at this point, but 33,000 more doctors a year. The United States was training 15,000, and the number of slots was not even uh, there as well. So uh, the, the point on this is that we are not fixing the problem. The NRMP, or the match organization, will brag about their increase, but they don't uh, consider the increase in the population or even the fact that population is not reflecting people that are here that are here. Uh, I speak Spanish. When we were in California, my patients were illegals. So, 
So to continue the theme of burning, uh, we just had our fire alarm. Uh, Dr. McCullough had a speech that talked about the house being on fire. Uh, I want to go a little bit farther than this because, yes, the house is on fire. Uh, and, yes, we've had a lot of people who have just mown the lawn in medicine for some time, oblivious to what's going on in the background. COVID's kind of woke them up. But I want to say that it's a little worse than just the house. How do you fight a house fire when the whole forest is on fire around it? The whole system's really broken at this point. Now, the worst way that medicine has, has been corrupted is that it's a captured entity. Now, my background includes economics and finance degrees, and I actually really loved economics, but I couldn't stand uh, the stock industry. But a lot of the thinking that is there is very valuable and applicable to medicine. And one of those is what is called regulatory capture. A person can capture a regulatory agency at a very small price for a great economic profit to that person. Um, and uh, lots of organizations have been doing this for many years, your hospital associations, even the AAMC, the, AR, uh, 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 the NRMP, all of the alphabet soup agencies that are actually in charge of medicine. They have controlled it and been able to pull out, out of that what is called excess profit or excess rents. Basically, they're a monopoly. Um, now, the greatest evidence that we have that me medicine has been captured, though, was COVID. The government discovered the, the capture of this organization and used it greatly to their own benefit to control a situation that they wanted to control. Um, I think that everybody in this room can kind of draw, uh, draw the lines between these dots here. Now, it's gone back a long time, though. This capture of the entity, this, this case I put underneath here, Jung versus AAMC, was a 2002 lawsuit brought by doctors against the NRMP, the AMA, and various other licensing bodies that said, hey, the residency process is very corrupt and wrong. We would like that to be stopped because it's an antitrust violation. Uh, instead of, uh, they were losing this case. This is the history. You can look this up. It's a very interesting uh, read. They were losing this case in the courts. They were about to have a settlement brought against them. So what did they do? Do it all corrupt people do. They went over to Congress at the national levels, inserted a bill that tied interest rates to pension funds, which was a must-pass bill, with uh, allowing the NRMP and the match process and the um, medical regulatory structures to be exempt from Sherman antitrust laws. Typical. So anyways, that happened in 2002, and we've been having bigger problems, bigger problems since then, because their lawsuit was correct. The, the, the NRMP was causing a doctor shortage. I'm going to go back to this slide for just real quick here. So I got a picture of the White House here, and I have them real small letters because I can't say it too loudly. Government capture? Could the government even use these regulatory agencies to their benefit? Yeah. Conspiracy theories. Um, so let's talk about this forest fire. What are some of these other pro uh, problems that we're seeing in medicine? Besides it being a captured entity, we are, uh, through the training process of doctors, creating, um, and I guess I put them all as number one, on uh, priorities, that was a mistake, but we'll just put them as ones. Um, there, is, there is an absence of diversity of thought. Now, diversity of thought is, a, is, a, is very important. We're going to get into that in a second here, especially in regards to medicine. But we also have authoritarian medical licensure. We have doctors trained in the wrong place in the wrong field. We have resident physician suicide and abuse rampant. And we have a lack of training actually happening in residency. So first, absence of diversity of thought. So, do you think that some residency programs who have unscrupulous people might discriminate against people who, say, don't have their worldviews? And then we have people going out there say, hey, I, I think I would like to have a doctor who has a Christian worldview. I'm sorry, those don't exist. They don't exist because we made sure they didn't. We made sure they didn't get into residency. Is there another way to deal with the depression? No, we only deal with drugs for depression. That's the only way to solve it. Because the other people, man, they don't make the cut. They can't get into residency. They might not even get into medical school. Let's crush the dissenting views. D diversity of thought, how dare you? Resident doctor, your lack of support for socialized medicine is dangerous. We will see you at the clinical competency board. Guideline medicine. By guidelines, they mean do what they say. Guideline medicine, I mean, best practice is always right. Don't question it. This is how we develop better treatment. Science. That's sarcastic, guys. <laughs> so this year, as people apply for medical school, 
I bet you on the applications, there's going to be a question of how many genders are there? Oh, not enough. Yeah, you got to trip over yourself to go to a million. Then you might get in. If you say two, good luck to you. Good luck. So, so that's one of the, the things. Let's go on to the next, authoritarian medical licensure. I know some people in this room have been experiencing this. I got the picture over here of supporting the current thing. I don't even know what all these flags are, but unless you have that posted on your Facebook profile, good luck. I think you better get on board with the treatment guidelines. Don't even think about going rogue. Non-compete and a little visit to the medical board. We might even be able to get a sham peer review going on you. I see you hold the wrong political view. Mm, canceled. Expect a letter from the licensing board next week. Oh, you want to teach at the medical school? Hmm. <laughs> I see you're not supporting the current thing. Denied. So doctors are also being trained in such a way that we put them in the wrong spot. Does Springfield, Missouri really need more medicine? Does it really need more doctors? Or is it Lamar, Missouri, out in the middle of nowhere? Yet residencies are always there. They're, they're there in the centralized places. Springfield, Kansas City, Phoenix. That's during the formative years of those young people. They're having children. Their schools are going for their young kids. They don't want to move them. Are they going to move out of there? No. And so now we have doctors where they aren't needed. And we don't have doctors where they are. In addition to this, I've got this nice Soviet flag over here. Controlling the number of doctors and specialties. That is precisely what the RMP does, is it not? They have a certain number of spots for each of the positions. And I, I put underneath there a quote. You're telling me the centralized planning of the Politburo has created shortage and waste? Hmm. Impossible. Swear fealty to the supreme leader of the residency board. Communism and central planning has never worked. Ever. Our good friend from California, Dr. Matos, who came with us from California to Missouri, tells us horrifying t stories of what happened in Cuba. But we have all of history to tell us that communism never worked. And yet, why are we practicing it in medicine? NRMP and that match process is entirely centrally planned. And we have created ourselves a massive problem. It is quite the huspa to think that it would work. It goes beyond you know, the jokes, because when a resident is in uh, their residency spot, they've got, you know, my wife and I, we both had $650,000 in debt each, each, just to give you some perspective on what it's costing nowadays for private schools. It's residency or bust, right? What do we do? What do we do if we don't, you know, finish this uh, god-awful program? What it happens when people have so much power over, uh, over a person's life? You know, here's real stories. I'm just shortening them, them here. Stop complaining about the hours or else. Have sex with me or else. Deny your faith or else. Do the transition procedure or else. Absolute power corrupts, and it corrupts absolutely. They are imprisoned without a way out, and this is why we see such an uptick in physician suicide, residency suicide. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the doctor who's done so much research on it, but um, what's her? Weibel. Weibel, that's right, Dr. Weibel, who has done so much research on this, and it is very much a, a, a trend, and it is something that should not be happening. These are people who have many protective factors from, from suicide and yet are killing themselves. Let's ask ourselves, why? And finally, I wanted to just talk about the residency itself. Now, some of the people in this room are a little bit older and have some grayer hair, and so their experience may have been a little bit different than what it is nowadays. But what I can tell you is that my wife and I were not very impressed. Not very impressed at all. Why well, Sage Preceptor? We, th we think, you know, on, on, the, on the left side of the screen there. In fact, what, what you have is the resident who just got out of uh, residency, or, or the preceptor who just got out of residency themselves and is drinking, playing Candy Crush, and I wish that this wasn't a joke, but it's true. It actually happened. So um, oversight, nah. Best practices, how about how to build the best? Yeah, that's what they're teaching. They aren't really teaching medicine. They just want to make sure you can get Medicare and Medicaid money for the clinics. So, so this is a rather sour uh, tune right now, but it does us no good to rage and, and shake our fists 
at what's going on right now. I think many of the people in the room are quite aware of the problems that are there. What are we going to do about it? And so that's what I'm here to talk to you about is, is some solutions that I've been working on for the last four years, including in the Missouri legislature and with the Cato Institute and with the Heritage Foundation. So we want to increase the number of trained general practice physicians, the family practice physicians in a decentralized process. Now, that's a lot of garbly goop, but what it basically means is we want to uncentralize the training process. That's where the problem began. That's where, where we're going to stop it. So we have uh, started the American Guild for Apprentice Physician Educators, AGAPE. I am Christian. I am not ashamed of that. It is at the heart of why we're doing what we're doing. For those that don't know, agape is a Greek word for love in the Bible. The mission statement of that organization is to create multiple routes to licensure for graduating physicians. Uh, our present route for doing this right now, we are focused very heavily on the state of Missouri. Uh, Missouri has right now a shortage of a full third, according to some organizations, of their primary care clinicians. And as such, they are looking for solutions and are very open to what we are talking about, and we have been able to make good headway with them. What we want to do is create this second little box over here, rather than residency, we want to create a certification process, which is codified in law, which says that if you meet these certain criteria, we're not trying to put in place snake oil salesmen. We do want to make sure people are competent, but if you meet these certain criteria, well, then you will be licensed to practice medicine in this state. Um, and what that will do is it will create a competitive environment. We do not want to create a residency process again. The residency is, non, is uncompetitive. We want a process whereby organizations can choose to use this certification process. If they meet the criteria, well, then they will be a certifier. They will be able to say, this person is allowed to practice medicine in the state of Missouri. And so Agape would be one of those. But you could start another one if you think you have a better way of doing it. Uh, rural hospitals could do it. I can tell you there's a lot of rural hospitals that are really hurting and would really be on board something like this. In addition to uh, decertifying the, uh, or I'm not sorry, uh, decentralizing the training process, we also wanted to um, uh, spread the money of training out as well. So those rural hospitals will start to get some of the training money rather than just all of this, the, the big city hospitals. This also has been very helpful in us pushing these things forward. So, how it works. An MD or DO graduates from medical school and applies at Agape or whatever organization wants to be a certifier. Step two, the review board or what, however that organization reviews applicants will look at that and determine eligibility. Obviously, you, like I said, we don't want to just put anyone in medicine. That's a very important position. Step three, that person, once they accept it, goes through an apprentice program, and they will work side by side with their, their partnered clinic for two years, after which they will receive GP licensure. And so this will be uh, somebody that does not go through residency, but will be uh, licensed as a general practitioner. Now, for those who may be a little bit older, you will, you will notice that I said what was the practice in the past. People don't realize this, but family medicine was not a thing until 1974. It was proposed in 1969, and I will correlate with you the shortage of rural family medicine and rural uh, clinicians with that time frame as those people got older, retired, and disappeared. Okay, So this, this here is, is a way for us to go back to the way that things were with slightly more oversight, actually. So I'm not proposing anything particularly radical. Now, this stuff here I don't want to bore you too heavily with, but what I can say, obviously I have an econ economics and finance background, but um, we had incoming MDs, we got a partner with the, the, the educator, and then they get licensure, and there's an economic model that gives them advantage on all parties. And so what I mean by that is there's going to be value created through all of these processes. Why is that possible? Because residency is really inefficient. Really, really inefficient. One and a half million dollars a year to train a resident I, I did not get that when I was there. It was not showing up. So I think, I think the margins are so wide I could drive five Mack trucks through. And I'm not exaggerating. So we have value to hire, value to the apprentice themselves, value to train, value to the certifier, value to the patient. So quickly, value to hire. This is the person who hires at the clinic. 
They could have hired this person at a lower rate. We subsidize them through our own model, through Agape. Uh, and, and actually, when you work through these models here, you will find that if a person were to train, say, in Missouri, where we can have six uh, people under that person's license, they actually have a full um, salary or physician salary coming in of extra revenue for that person, plus they get the production of that uh, employed person or six employed people. So value to hire for those people. Value to train is, 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 is also in here. So this is the subsidy that I was just talking about. This is the value to the apprentice, to the doctor. Who, rather than going into a, a, a residency program, why should they choose this route? They get paid more, and they'll get better training. At least that's our hope. They, we, we would recommend double the salary for that person when they come out. Why not? They're worth it. Why are they going to pay 50000 That's a joke. We all know that their work is worth more than that. They can't even pay their student loans. And so uh, we expect that they would make more over time. Now, how does it get paid for? They, they sign a promissory note by which they pay back over the next six years some of their salary to the person prior. Now, it's a promissory note, not a debt um, instrument. Uh, and that's important because I want the person who's training to eat their own cooking. If they don't do a good job, good luck, because you've got to have that person pay you back, okay? I want incentives in line on there. Value to the, the certifying organizations, so Agape, it's a business model. It would make money. It has to because we have to fund all the programs that go with it. And then finally, most importantly, value to the patient. What do they get? They actually get doctors again. Where I'm from, that's a real big problem. That's a real big problem. In our town right now, they got six nurse practitioners up the road, but no doctor. A Cox has been having a hard time filling up their clinic with a doctor. Mercy, the same. I don't ever see cars there. It's not too hard to run a competitor in that environment. Um, in addition to having a doctor, we also are hoping that the doctor themselves will be of greater value to them by having an improved clinician. We're very focused on the clinician side right now. Could this scale into other things? Yes. But right now, we're very focused on primary care, clinician care. Um, we expect that with this type of, of, of model that we can have quality time for appointments again because that shortage begins to be removed. Um, relationships being restored with patients rather than the way it's being practiced right now with the physician extenders. Affordability of care. I'm sorry, but I'm working myself out of a job on purpose here. I really don't care. I worked in oil before this, and I didn't come into this for the money. I went into this to uh, tr try to actually make a, a difference and help people in their lives. Finally, I am hopeful that this also will bring some, bring some worldview compatibility with um, patients and their doctors. Uh, I can tell you from my experience as a doctor and my wife in, in our small rural town that people come to us and they're just like, oh, thank God, you're not crazy. Probably a lot of people in this room have that type of practice. They're tired of people who are pushing HPV vaccines on their non-sexually active child, knowing that there's side effect profiles, right? They want somebody who, who doesn't just buy like a sheep whenever the CDC makes a recommendation. They want somebody who's thinking. They want somebody who actually can pray with their patient, perhaps, or pay attention to what their religious beliefs are. So, so I, I want to just summarize why this helps to solve the force that is on fire. We want to decentralize training. Centralized training is dangerous. It brings power into too few people's hands, and they have grabbed it, and they are in control right now, and they are causing havoc. We don't want to just have it decentralized by doing the, 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 this in Missouri alone. We do Missouri, then we do Texas, we do Arizona, each of them individually, and it's not a national level, because we want freedom, and we want people to be able to say, as our forefathers wisely did, that division of power is a good idea. So, how does the decentralized uh, training work besides the power dynamic? Let's say you're from Mullen, Nebraska. I'm from a very small town in Nebraska. Mullen is in the middle of nowhere, by the way, um, really out there. You've got a little clinic out there. You're 78 years old, and you've re delayed retiring because you know when you retire, there's nobody left. Train your, your predecessor. That's what this program will allow you to do. It also would give you an incentive to bring them out there. You could forgive their six-year note promissory note after you train them. You just need somebody out there to take care of the people you love, right? It gives opportunity for diversity of thought. 
Freedom's scary, deal with it. De decentralized licensure, each state creating it, not a national level. Once again, freedom is dangerous. It's scary, deal with it. We want competition for the medical graduates. You mean I have to be nice to them or they leave? Are you a barbarian? You mean they hold different opinions than me? Are you a barbarian? You mean I have to pay them more than a bag of peanuts? Are you a barbarian? All right, so I want to finish with this analogy. Can you capture rocket fairings? Now, I am a space nerd. Before anybody knew who Elon Musk was, I was sitting in my family's farm basement watching him in 2002 trying to start SpaceX. And sometime along the line, he said, hmm, we're throwing away $10 million when we have these fairings that cover up the satellites on the top of the rocket fall into the ocean. And so he asked his engineers, if you have $10 million falling out of the sky, do you try to catch it? The answer is yes. And so this is him trying to catch it. Eventually, they did it a little bit different than this, but it works, and they save their fairings every time. It is an enormous human capital waste when we have medical graduates going through medical school, not getting into residency, and throwing them away in the face of a shortage. The value of training of a doctor is somewhere north of 500,000. Their, their value just on economic terms is $10 million in their lifetime or more. But what is the value to the society when they have no doctor or when they have a doctor? It's not enough, though, for me to talk about capturing fairings. We want to fix the whole damn thing. Land the rocket. The thing's corrupt as can be, and we all know it. And so we don't just fix the situation with the, with the medical graduates. We go in here and we create our own training program where we can have some say in the worldviews of the people who are going to go into medicine. If we do not do this, this room will be empty because all they're going to do in the next 10 years, all those people who said one million genders will be the only people in charge left. And you will be at the end of their needle when you're in your older age. This is a critical, critical thing that needs to be done. We must change the course of medicine. I want to thank you so much for spending the time listening to me today. Um, I've summarized these points right here, but if you want to do, uh, uh, contact me, here's my email right here, Dr. Lyman Wastrel at zionasher.com. Uh, go ahead and get a hold of me, and you, I'll give you my phone number at that time. I get too many spam calls, so, but if you would like to talk to me, you can do that there as well. Super. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wastrel, for a very uh, intriguing presentation of an alternative to medical licensure, a training model that, in fact, was successful in the past.